Hello everybody and welcome to the Thursday edition of Video Clips and in this um, edition I am going to continue answering questions that were posed to me by thoughtful people. I'll remind you not all not everybody agrees with me. I'm not looking for universal agreement. I'm looking for civil conversation. And uh, one thing I want to talk about is I got a, a very um, uh, interesting email from somebody who uh, talking about tone who said I'm sarcastic and and I am a little sarcastic, actually. When people make, when people are panicked for no reason, when people are suffering economic devastation for no reason, when I see the federal government lying to people all the time, I am a little sarcastic about it. And I have to say, I'm really not sure that those of you who do like my channel really want to see a dispassionate person who doesn't give a flip about anything get here and just report it to you and say, great, have a great day. I don't really care about any of this stuff. I'm just telling you about it. I really do care about this stuff. And, um, and so perhaps if you are bothered by the fact that I care, you just should watch somebody who doesn't. But this girlfriend cares about this stuff, which is why I spend so much time on it. So um, let's get to coronavirus. And uh, I'm, not in, I'm finished apologizing for tone and attitude. I am who I am, and I'm not in a popularity contest, I don't think. I just want to make people aware of information I think they should have. So here's a good question. What would be helpful? If the stay at home and the shelter at home and all that stuff, quarantines aren't helpful, what would be helpful? Well, I'll start by telling you an analogy um, that is you, that a great doctor used, Dr. David Katz, who's speaking at our fall conference here. Um, he, I always call him the grown up in the room. He always has the right thing to say. He's very deliberate and thoughtful about what he says. And he's one of the doctors I mentioned on Tuesday who's speaking out about how ill-advised this current uh, program is. And he said, you know, it would, be a it would be like saying, we have a real problem with people who don't know how to swim drowning. And that is a problem. People who don't know how to swim can drown. So there are two ways with that we could deal with it. We could, for example, um, put all the lifeguards at the beaches and swimming pools. That's where the drownings are likely to happen. And they can intervene when a person is starting to drown. Or we could have lifeguards walking up and down the streets of the cities all over Columbus or all over the United States, rather, and asking people, stopping people on the sidewalk and saying, hey, do you know how to swim? Do you know how to swim? You don't? Well, come with me. I'll teach you how to swim. Well, obviously, if we're investing all the effort of lifeguards on that, we're missing the opportunity for lifeguards to be where the drownings are happening. And that's what's happening here. Now, here's the point. We know who the vulnerable people are. Elderly people who are confined to nursing homes, for example. The Italian data is really clear. That's who's dying of coronavirus over there. And people who are immunocompromised and very sick. And I talked a little bit about that in Tuesday's video. Um, we should isolate these people and make sure that we're very careful about who is visiting them to deliver healthcare services or food or whatever else is going on. Keeping me out of the library does not do anything for a person who's in a nursing home. And if the person in the nursing home is isolated properly and, and the visits are very controlled, healthy people only, only for healthcare purposes, etc., then me being in the library doesn't make any difference. Again, lifeguards walking the streets looking for people who don't know how to swim, not very helpful. Um, Another person writes that just because there were not quarantines during previous flu seasons doesn't mean that they wouldn't have helped. Now, I'm not sure how to answer this, but I will say that humanity cannot exist locking everybody down for a few months when the flu season hits because hundreds of millions of people get the flu every year, according to the World Health Organization, and you just can't batten down the hatches and shut down everything when that happens. Another thing I'll mention is look up the number of suicides that took place during the Great Depression. Also do some research on the effects of joblessness, economic stress, and food insecurity on health. It's devastating. Millions of people have lost their jobs, many with just a few hours notice, and many of whom were living on the edge financially before this. We're hearing from them. They're broke, and they're soon going to be hungry. And when people become broke enough and hungry enough and desperate enough, stay-at-home orders don't mean anything to them at all. We're going to have looting and pillaging and violence like you've never seen before. And this is one more reason. I mentioned on Tuesday the, the problem with people who really need health care not getting it. But another problem we're going to have is people who are, who are going to become violent and angry and take it out on the population as a whole as a result of this. Again, indicating that at some point in time, the cure is going to be far worse than the disease. 
All right, so another person writes to me, while there's an importance in encouraging people to stand up to misinformation and learn to think critically, there's also a danger in getting people to never trust reliable institutions, to continue to make mass generalizations or believe in partial truths and to create a monster of a different kind. Well, I'd say to this writer, you're really on to me. I do wanna create a monster. Hundreds of millions of people who stop trusting medical institutions and government because there are good reasons not to trust them. I don't want people making mass generalizations and I don't want them to believe in anything. And I don't make mass generalizations. My data are very, the things I talk about generally on this YouTube channel are very, very specific. I want people to make decisions based on facts. For example, most people do not survive cancer by believing in their oncologists. Um, Kelly Turner's study of a thousand terminal cancer patients who lived, one of the characteristics of those survivors was that their doctors described them as being annoying because they wouldn't follow directions. So I don't want people believing in anything. I want people checking things out. I don't believe in real estate agents and car salespeople and I, I believe in checking things out and making smart decisions and that's what I'm promoting here. Now, when we talk about uh, reliable institutions, I don't know what reliable institutions this person's referring to, but let's talk about some of the institutions that we're stuck with in the United States. The drug companies have paid billions of dollars to the FDA in user fees, and they will pay $1.1 billion to the FDA this year. The approval rates for new products and vaccines and that sort of thing have reached 96%, and they've remained there for several years. I'd like to see the 4% they're turning down. It must be really interesting stuff. Um, I reported a couple of weeks ago um, about the FDA, uh, and, and this became this story was in a lot of different uh, mainstream newspapers, and, and uh, it was talked about on news programs. The FDA actually created a secret website which allowed device makers to post their really bad adverse events and separate those out from the public database that the public saw so that people were completely misled for about 20 years as to how dangerous the devices and implants and things of that nature were that they were getting. Now, I'm not sure that we would call these reliable institutions, but uh, I haven't found many of these kinds of institutions in food, medicine, and health, which are the fields that I investigate and write about. So I'm not talking about generalizations or partial truths. These are facts that are easily verified. I've written books, almost 1,500 referenced articles, and I've developed 3,500 hours of educational programming documenting facts like these. These video clips are snippets of that information because the business I'm in is making the material that I create available. Some of you are concerned about what you perceive to be a conspiracy theory. For example, China interfering with our elections. Again, if you just do a Google search, you'll come up with about 800,000 results on this topic, including YouTube videos of members of Congress of both parties, the Justice Department, um, Secretary of State, uh, public officials who were in the Obama administration and the Bush administration. In other words, this isn't a party issue where one party says it and the other didn't. If you go back to particularly early this year, politicians on both sides of the aisle were crystal clear that they expected China to interfere with our election. This isn't a conspiracy theory. It's what is what was expected. And, and a lot of people who you quote when you scream at me, by the way, um, have been saying this for a long time. I mean, even NPR did stories on China's uh, potential to interfere with our elections. So I said in my one of my first videos that I thought that that's what was going on, and uh, I think they did a spectacular job if that was their goal. Now, you can disagree with me on it, but I think it's difficult to discount entirely the idea of China interfering in our election when it was expected, when the intelligence officials were telling people that that was eventually going to happen. Um, China's quarantine policy, all right? Um, some of you said that we should have followed their example and that's why the disease has been so well controlled in China. Well, I think it's real important to differentiate between what you can do when operating a communist regime versus running a republic. By the way, we're not a democracy, we are a republic here. In communist countries, people don't have rights and here they do. A growing number of attorneys are publishing analyses showing that what has been done here in the United States is completely unconstitutional. One good example is, and I did look into this, in fact, I read the Ohio statutes on this, the health department in the state of Ohio is not permitted to change elections. The only people that can change elections are, are the legislature. And um, 
And there were all of the, the Department of Health in Ohio overstepped its bounds in so many major ways um, against the Ohio Constitution and the U.S. Constitution. I am um, expecting very soon that lawsuits are going to start to be filed if this nonsense doesn't stop against states and perhaps even some of the feds, uh, federal agencies, over some of the actions that have been taken which were completely unwarranted. So please remember, this is a, and, and I, uh, these are by organizations, by the way, that have been suing the government for years and doing it extremely successfully. They've won major cases that you know about. I don't want to get into too much of that right now, but just to let you know that um, if you get online and start looking around, you'll see the same things that I'm seeing, and some of them I have a personal relationship with, and I've gotten data from them. So, um, you know, we, this is a different country and we don't operate that way. We have constitutional rights here and when they're taken away, there has to be a very good reason and there's no way to justify the numbers. I keep coming back to that. 493 cases, 493,000 cases and, um, uh, you know, 15, 20, 30,000 deaths, 20,000 deaths, I think it is as of this morning. Uh, when there were 65 million with the H1N1 and none of this kind of thing. I don't think in a court of law that these people can defend their actions and hopefully it won't come to that. I, I don't like lawsuits unless they're necessary, but I think if the country doesn't open up soon, we're going to have some of those. Um, one other thing about China's quarantine policy, it's just another inconsistent fact that doesn't add up. It's incomprehensible that the Chinese, even with their authoritarian regime, regime were able to keep 100% of the citizens of Hubei from leaving and that nobody from outside came in. Yet, I looked on the Chinese medicine data, or a Chinese uh, health ministry database, there were 33 deaths outside of Hubei as of this morning, and the entire country of China out of um, 1.7 billion people. It's hard to fathom how this could be. There were only 537 cases in Beijing and 404 in Shanghai. Now, if you take a look at the panic here and all the are not numbers and stuff that people want to throw around, if you had 537 people in a densely populated area like Beijing, there should have been tens of thousands of cases and people dropping dead in the streets and, and um, uh, it, that just didn't happen. Same thing in Shanghai. Uh, China is a densely populated area and if this is really as contagious as everybody says, there should be lots more sick people there. And there just simply are not. So um, one, another thing I want to uh, cover is that um, when, you, when you start to uh, engage with me talking about a data point, um, I want you to ask some questions first before you, you take me to task on this. Um, when I created my coronavirus course, um, I spent, I don't know, 75 or 80 hours, maybe more than that, combing through databases, getting materials translated from other countries and all this sort of thing. And so you can understand how I get a little prickly when somebody hears something on the news and then says, well, you're wrong. This guy on the news said this and this. And, and so all that work that you did going through databases, I don't want to check it out for myself. I'm just going to say, hey, so-and-so said it on the news last night. So therefore they're right, you're wrong. Well, that's a ridiculous way to approach it. So, you know, let's, let's look at when you put context to something. So I must have had, I don't know, a thousand people write to me about, well, look what's going on in Italy. People are dying. Okay. Well, let's look at what's going on in Italy. Um, and I have the data and, and it's clear that the older people, elderly people, 80 years old and older with a majority of those deaths, and they all had comorbidities. They had cardiovascular disease and diabetes and that sort of thing. I talked about that on Tuesday. This makes a person more vulnerable to anything happening. And some of these people were going to die this year anyway because they were old and they were sick and they were confined. All right. Um, another thing, there were only five deaths in people under 30, all severely ill with comorbidities. Um, the Italian healthcare system has been shrinking for a long time partly because of the, um, the birth rate being low for so long. I mean, for some reason, Italians stopped having babies a couple generations ago, and that's why the average age of the Italians is older, and that, bears, that puts some context to these data too. So there's, a, there's been a 50% drop in the number of intensive care beds, and I'm sure that that's been an issue. The data show that most of those who died were given antibiotics, not antiviral medications, so could it be that these people actually died of hospital-acquired infections? That's not out of the realm of possibility. So if you were going to send a snarky email about Italy, ask yourself, did I review any documents? Did I check any of this stuff out? Did I know at firsthand anything at all? Or did I just hear somebody say something and I took it for granted? When I put this information out, 
I tell you where I get it from CDC, from WHO, this came from the Italian government, I got information from the Chinese government, you can get that information too. And, and I called the American Hospital Association, you can call them too and check out the numbers. And um, I get the feeling in some of the emails that I get that that hasn't been done, yet you really wanna say nasty things about what I reported. So, you know, check it out. I think you'd be shocked at what you find. Um, one person writes, frankly, I appreciate naturopathic view as a data point in my thinking, but basically it ends up being the flip side of uh, standard medicine with similar pitfalls. I agree. And this goes to something I said on Tuesday. Please don't watch one video and then think you know everything about what I do or what I think or how I think or what I say or what I stand for. It takes more than that. Gosh, if you could size me up in five minutes, that would be a pretty remarkable skill. Um, I was trained as a naturopath. I don't think naturopathy is a valid profession. I think the training is awful. When people call here and they're thinking about going to naturopathy school, I tell them I won't let you off the phone until you promise me you're going to go to a real medical school and get a real medical degree. I'm serious. People will tell you that. So I'm not so big on naturopathy either, and I don't talk about anything from a naturopathic point of view, and I think that's one of the reasons I have um, credibility. Another person writes, so what if this situation benefits China? That's interesting, but it doesn't prove that it's a threat to us now. Well, you know, I think that what goes on in the world is, it affects all of us. We live in a world where everything is pretty interrelated. And if a foreign regime ha wants to interfere in our lives in any significant way, and an election is a significant way, inability to get drugs what, that we are, that are manufactured in China, that's significant. So I could go on, but, but there, everything that goes on in China impacts the United States. So I think that it's important for us all to be aware of that because if citizens are not aware of the impact of what goes on in China here, then they can't possibly evaluate what our politicians and uh, leaders are doing with China. In other words, if you have no idea the relationship between the United States and China and what the trade agreements look like and that sort of thing, I don't really think you should be commenting on it because what would you possibly know? How could you say anything constructive? And I think that goes to a major problem that we have here that, that the coronavirus crisis has uh, brought to light, which is that we, um, uh, we have a lot of people talking about stuff and I think that's great, but they're not talking about it because they've really dug in and researched about it. They're talking about it because they're just parroting what other people say. And that's something that I've spoken out about for years and years and years. I call health professionals on it. If you're just repeating what some other person told you, then you don't know what you're talking about. As soon as somebody challenges you, you won't be able to answer them and you could be wrong. So check things out yourself. Um, another thing that was a common theme, um, and this is the last one I'm gonna uh, cover on this particular video, had to do with um, this lifetime immunity to disease. And somebody said, send me the reference for that. Well, I'll tell you the reference for that is uh, medical school textbooks, okay? Once you have, look into how your immune system works. Again, um, you can order those textbooks on Amazon and get them and read them yourself. So the way that your immune system works is once you have a virus or something of that nature, your body makes antibodies to that specific virus. And it's one of the reasons why you may not get sick at all or even know that you're exposed to it again. That is the whole foundation of the vaccine program in the country, which doesn't work, but that's not the point, is that you're supposed to have exposure to a virus one time and be immune for the rest of your life. That's why you get a measles vaccine. Well, the vaccines don't work, which is why they keep increasing the boosters. And that's a different topic for a different day. But my point is that, um, that if you understand human immune systems and function, then you understand that once exposed, you are always immune. And that goes to that we might have been much better off just letting this thing spread like wildfire, like viruses do every year. Lots of people would get immune to it. It could never hurt us again. The, it would not change the fact that the elderly and the vulnerable and sick would be at risk. But if we had focused all of our attention on them, instead of this nonsense of keeping trying to keep everybody away from everybody and inciting fear and panic, we would have been so much more effective in the end. So what I'm hoping, I don't know if I'm going to do more videos on this. We'll see how things shake out in the next few days. Just for the record, I'm recording this on Thursday, March 26th. I have to record in advance because my days are so busy. I can't like wait till the last minute and do it. So we'll see how things shake out in the next few days. 
Um, I do welcome comments and I do want to hear from you. Um, I'm not willing to engage with people who are insulting and use bad language and all that sort of thing. I just, I put, I block those people. Uh, report the ones that sound dangerous or unhinged to me and some of them do. Uh, but from reasonable people, I want to, I want to hear from you. And um, I can't really type paragraph upon paragraph. So if there's a lot of feedback that needs answering, I'll do it next week. And um, uh, one thing that you might want to do is if you're not familiar with my work, read my book, Food Over Medicine, watch a lot of these videos. Um, I don't expect you to agree with me on everything. I expect you to conclude that I am thoughtful about what I say. I check things out before I talk about them. Um, I, don't I don't repeat what other people say. Um, in fact, one of the things that took a lot of time in creating the coronavirus course was the fact that there is so much being reported, even on websites that are trying to be helpful, that I was unable to verify. If somebody would say, well, so-and-so virologist said, and I couldn't find a single independent source that could verify it, so I just couldn't use it. And that was one of the things that made um, tracking down this information very difficult because there's a lot of chatter out there, not much of it verifiable. So um, that's all for today as usual. Hit the subscribe button if you're new and you'd like to hear from me more often. Uh, pass this on to anybody who you think would enjoy watching it. My email address is pampopper at msn.com. I'll be back to you next week with more news.